I'd like to start, unfortunately, on a somber note. I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection by the end of the afternoon. My sense is, and I hope I'm dead wrong on what I'm about to say, I really do. My sense is that we are in very, very deep trouble as a species. I look at these little babies that are two and three years old and I wonder, is this the last generation before we ourselves experience a mass die-out on this planet? It's hard to say something like this. I always feel it's so melodramatic and over the top. And I'm mindful in history, there have been many, many apocalyptic visions of doom. And thank God they've all been wrong. But I'm going to share a statistic with you this afternoon, and you make the judgment call. I teach at the Wharton School. It's the oldest business school in the world. And I teach uh, CEOs and corporate executives from around the world. And when they sit down for the first day in class, I ask them, do you know what the primary economy of the world is? And of course they don't. It's photosynthesis. That's the bottom line. We all depend on that for life on this little planet in the universe. Now, we human beings, we're the youngest species in the evolutionary neighborhood. We're the babies here. We've only been here 175,000 years, anatomically modern humans. We have 6.8 billion in numbers now. But in terms of biomass, we only represent one half of 1% of all the living biomass on the Earth. That's all. We're currently using, and I want every parent to hear this, we're currently using 31% of all the photosynthesis of the Earth. And we're going from 7 to 9 billion people in the next 30 years. We're monsters. We're devouring the ecosystems of this Earth. And I'm always mindful when I talk about this statistic. About 30, 40 years ago, I recall hearing a story about the Iroquois Nation, which kept with me for a long time. I understand that Thomas Jefferson was an admirer of some of their political arrangements in this great nation. And when the Iroquois chiefs had to make a decision that dramatically affected the immediate moment of the community they were in, they would ponder the question, how does the decision we make today affect our children's 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 children? The Iroquois didn't live for the moment because they realized they had obligations across a long time span in history. Their ancestors spoke from the grave, saying you have covenants you have to fulfill, responsibilities that we've handed down. They heard their unborn children and all the creatures not yet here saying, watch out for our interest, we're coming next. So when the Iroquois chiefs made decisions, they had to project into the future and try to imagine, which is our great gate as a species, we can imagine and find the metaphors to imagine what their decisions might do seven generations removed. We wouldn't be in the situation we are in now if we had that kind of time span and that kind of consciousness. We have had two events in the last three years which I believe signal the great end game for the industrial age built on fossil fuels. The first event, July 2008, you recall that month, oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. Purchasing power plummeted. The entire economic engine of the Industrial Revolution shut down. What I'm suggesting to you this afternoon, that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. My colleagues are still dealing with the aftershock. They're not dealing with the attendant problem because to come to grips with July 2008, is to try to understand we have to rethink civilization quickly almost overnight. We now know in the business community the outer limits of how far we can globalize based on fossil fuels. It's about $147, $150 a barrel. Why? We've hit peak globalization. And the reason is everything in this civilization is based on the carbon deposits of the Carboniferous era. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. All of our construction materials are petrochemical based, from cement to plastics. Virtually all of our pharmaceutical products, with a few exceptions, are still petrochemical based. Most of our clothes are synthetic fiber. Our power, transport, heat, light, this entire civilization is based on those carbon deposits. 
I try to think of what future generations might think of us if we do make it through this very, very dark period in the next century. 50,000 years from now, the monuments will be gone. Uh, our historical record will not exist. And the only way they will know we were ever here is they will check out our carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide footprint in the geological record, and they'll say, way back then, they were the oil people. They lived off carbon. We had the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. They were the fossil fuel age. They created a great short-lived civilization, almost collapsed the planet. We survived. So when oil starts to go over 75 a barrel, which it did in 2006, all the other prices across the supply chain go up from food to petrol. When oil hit $120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries all of us because 40% of the human and race then we ask the question, where are we? Class. Why aren't we here? Here's pillar one. The EU in 2007 committed itself to 20% renewable energy by 2020. They also committed to 20% energy efficiency increase, 20% reduction of global warming gases. That's to keep the old system afloat and get it tighter so we can move to the new one. The big revolution, 20% renewable energy, a third of the electricity in Europe renewable. 30% is what we're working on now. We'll go up in the figures. That was pillar one. Then we asked the question, okay, we're going to renewable energies. How do we collect them? Our first thought was, well, okay, we know where the sun is. The Italians, the Greeks, the Spanish, they got a lot of sun. North Africa, we'll go there, build these big centralized solar power plants, put a high voltage line in and send it on to Europe. The Irish have the wind, the Norwegians have the hydro, centralize it, ship it out. None of us oppose some of these large solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro projects. They're essential to get us off carbon. They're not sufficient. And they are only a small part of a third industrial revolution. We began to ask a question that sounds pretty silly now, but we started to say, wait a minute. If distributed energies are actually distributed, and they're found in some frequency and proportion in every square inch of this planet, ocean, and land, why in heaven's name would we only collect them in a few central points? That's 20th century centralized thinking. And greed, the old energy forces are not happy with what I'm outlining to you today. We came to pillar two. What is pillar two? Buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the European Union. Our goal is to convert every single existing building, if possible, to a micro power plant that can suck up the energy around the building, the sun on the roof, the wind on the walls, the heat under the ground, the works. This jump starts construction and moves an economic revolution forward. Thousands of SMEs and millions and millions and millions of jobs to convert the entire building stock of Europe in 40 years. That's a revolution. And the new buildings we have up are positive power. We have them up now. Olivio Buig showed me his largest construction company in the world three years ago, his, his new building. It came up three months ago. It's in the Paris suburbs. It's drop-dead gorgeous. It sucks up just enough sun so it can actually send more power back to the grid than it even needs. So pillar one, renewable energy. Pillar two, convert the buildings to power plants. Not unimportant because the number one source of energy use is our buildings, and they create the most climate change. By the way, does anyone know what the number two source of climate is problem? What's the number two source of industrial reduced climate? Huh? Food. It's beef production and consumption. Beef production and consumption and related animal husbandry. Yet not one leader in 192 countries, including the leaders I advise, has made one statement on the number two cause of climate change. Even Al Gore is reluctant. How serious are we here? Number three is transport. So buildings. Then pillar three, we came up with the question, how do we store this energy because the sun isn't always shining? Or sometimes the wind's blowing at night, but you want the electricity during the day. So we committed 8 billion euros to putting in hydrogen to store these energies. Hydrogen is the elemental universal particle. It's the lightest particle in existence. Our astronauts have been circling this Earth for 30 years. You know how they power their spaceships? Hydrogen fuel cells. So when people say this technology is 100 years away, no, it's 30 years too late. We should have done this a long time ago. So the sun hits your roof, you generate electricity. If you have some surplus you don't need, you electrolyze the water. The hydrogen comes into a tank. When the sun's not shining, you just convert it back to electricity. It is a very small thermodynamic loss compared to getting coal, oil, gas, and uranium to you 
across thousands of miles. Then pillar four, this is where the communication revolution converges with the energy revolution. It's a distributed nervous system of a new economic paradigm. We take off the shelf internet technology and we're going to take the whole power grid of Europe. It's going to cost one trillion euros in the next 10 years. And we're going to convert it, that power grid, those transmission lines, into an energy internet that acts exactly like the internet. So when millions and millions and millions of buildings are collecting energy on site, storing it in hydrogen, like we store digital with media, if you don't need some of that energy, your software can direct it across all of Europe from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia. Think mainframe computer, you have your own desktop now. Think centralized power plants, now your building's your power plant. Pillar five, electric plug-in vehicles are out with Chevy Volt, Nissan Leaf this year. Fuel cell vehicles are in production for 36 months from now with Daimler and GM, but they've got to plug it in. You'll power up in your buildings, your own green energy, and then anywhere around the country, you're going to have power charging units. They're coming in all over Europe now, thousands of them. You can plug in in any parking space, and even now they have little tracks that will be right under the, uh, the pavement. So your bus or your car will go up the track on the track. You'll stop at a light. It will power you up in two, two seconds. Total power. Green energy. These five pillars together are the new technology platform for a third industrial revolution. They have to phase in together. If you see them as each pilots or siloed projects and they don't connect with the synergies, there's no multiplier effect and we end up losing billions. The problem with President Obama is not that he doesn't think green, but he doesn't have the narrative I just outlined. So he spends billions and billions on these isolated projects across industries that don't connect and create a new infrastructure for a new economic revolution. It's pathetic, it's wasteful, it's sad. For a president that was elected from an internet generation, how hard would it be for him to say to the young people, you grew up in power to create your own information, and you've created a complete revolution of democratizing information, and you're now interacting on social sites across the world. How about now we put our sleeves, roll up our sleeves, and we work together so that you can be empowered to create your own energy and share it across continents? That took 20 seconds to say. Right. The but the old energy interests said, are still at the we door. We may be on the face of a very big problem here. Starvation, mass scale. Never faced that before. At 147, it shut down. The reason this is happening is something called peak oil per capita, which is not to be confused with peak oil production. They're related. Global peak oil production, many of you probably know about. It. It's when half the oil reserves in the world are used up on the classic Hubert bell curve in geology. When half the crude oil reserves are used up, it's over because you move down the curve as fast as you go up and the prices go up through the roof. There's been controversy about global peak oil for 25, 30 years. The International Energy Agency, the ultimate authority in Paris on which governments rely, said, look, 2001 they did a study. They said at a 2 percent, 3 percent growth rate, we would probably peak around 2035. Not very much time, just a, a hair of time, but still a little breathing space. In the last dozen years, however, some of the great geologists in the world using new computer simulation studies uh, and uh, and even factoring in all sorts of new oil discoveries that we don't know about yet, and even 80, 90 percent efficiency in getting the remaining oil and gas out, their studies keep showing maybe peak between 2010 and 2020. The IEA probably put it to rest last December. You probably didn't hear about this, but all of us in the business community did. The IEA laid down a bomb last December in its World Energy Report, and they said, we likely peaked, this is the IEA, in 2006 at 70 million barrels a day. And we'll probably plateau down to 69 million barrels a day, but it's going to cost $7 trillion in the next 20 years to get the remaining oil and gas out. But the reason we hit peak globalization in July 2008 is something called peak oil per capita. It occurred in 1979. It's not controversial. BP did the study. Others have confirmed this over and over. If we were to distribute all the oil reserves, crude oil, we had back in that year to everyone alive on the planet and we shared it, that's the most each person could have. We found more oil since then, but population rose quicker. So if we were to distribute all the crude oil we have now to 6.8 billion people, there's simply less to go around. You see where I'm heading? When China and India made a bid 
at 8, 10, 12, 14 percent growth rate to bring one-third of the human race into the game, the demand for the output of oil was so great, it put too much pressure against the supply than 147 a barrel. Prices went through the roof. You stopped buying, the engine shut down. Every time we try to regrow the economy at the same growth rate we were experiencing before 2008, this is going to happen. In the last year and a half, you notice we've been replenishing inventories. So what happened? We started to grow the economy again, right? And what happened again? Oil, which had sunk down to 30 a barrel because we weren't moving the economy, suddenly shot up to 94 a barrel before the kids erupted on the streets of Tunisia and Cairo. This afternoon, it's 118 a barrel again. And what's happening? Prices are going up all across the supply chain, from gasoline to basic food, and purchasing power is starting to stall, and the economy is going down again. This is a wild end game between growth collapse, growth collapse. It's very dangerous. It's going to go on for the next 30 years as we make a transition, and we are in trouble. When I mention this with my colleagues and the heads of state that I, that I advise, they go like this and then back to business as usual, some of them. It's too big for them to get their hands around. It means we're going to have to do it for them. The second event, December 2009, Copenhagen, 193 heads of state come together to deal with the entropy bill for the industrial age, the spent CO2. Any engineers here today? Well, you engineers know more than most economists because economists have never studied the laws of thermodynamics, which actually govern economic activity, which makes me a little frightened about the profession. But as you know, you cannot escape the second law of thermodynamics. This is not a metaphor. We have so much spent CO2 entropy in the atmosphere and methane and nitrous oxide from an industrial-induced civilization that when the sun's rays hit the earth, then that heat tries to come back up. It's hitting those CO2 molecules and the methane and nitrous oxide molecules and then forcing it back down. It's as simple and complex as that. How bad is climate change? It's much worse than you're being told, even though in this country we've dummied down the debate and everyone's in denial. Not so in other parts of the world. 2007, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its long-awaited assessment report on climate. It was published in Paris. President Chirac asked me to come at that point in time. We brought in world leaders, and my job was to ask, where do we go from here in terms of an economic plan? When I uh, addressed the question, the first thing I said is I had, I had to make an admission. I had gotten it wrong, wrong for 30 years. For 30 years, I had underestimated the speed of climate change because I wasn't able to understand the full gravity of the feedback loops, and that's what's terrifying us at this point. It's the feedback loops. We don't see them till they happen. Then we say to ourselves, how could we have missed that? So our scientists are telling us, 2,500 scientists, 125 countries, all the academies of science, they're saying to us, we probably will see in the mid-range no a 3 degrees Celsius the rise in temperature they on provide the lobbying in interest. Century. So, we found this out in Europe. If you, we put in feed-in tariffs so everybody could get premium for putting their energy, getting their renewable energy into the grid, you get a premium. But then we realized, my God, we've got to put a trillion into the grid because it's a servo-mechanical, unidirectional, old-fashioned grid. So if millions of people are trying to get energy into the grid, there's no way to do it. It's not digitalized. Then we realized, my God, we, don't, we not only have to do the grid, but we have to incentivize green mortgages and loans so that all the homeowners and SMEs can have low discounted loans so they can put the renewables on their building so they can then make money from the feed-in tariffs. You with me? And we're now doing that. Then we realized if we don't store this energy, some of our regions are 20 percent renewable and we're losing three out of four kilowatts because we're not storing it. The sun isn't always shining. Got to grab it when it is. Same with the wind. And then we realized all of our electric vehicles will collapse. The system won't work unless we have the other four pillars in place. So this is a system. It's a paradigm change. And it creates a completely new business model. This is distributed capitalism. This is, requires everyone being an entrepreneur, but it requires collaboration and community. Think Internet. 
Let me say that uh, the music companies did not understand file sharing in music. They thought it was a joke. Then they thought they'd legislate it and, and get rid of it. And then the music companies collapsed. You can't beat millions of kids who have nothing else to do but find software to get it for free. They're going to win. Some of the winners just smiled and laughed. See, Encyclopedia Britannica couldn't figure out Wikipedia. Why would millions of people who are amateurs recreate the history of the world and cross-check each other's references for accuracy? <laughs> now Wikipedia is the 10th largest website in the world. And the newspapers didn't understand the blogosphere. Now the newspapers are going out because distributed power dwarfs it. The reason we can do what I'm saying here, for 30 years governments say, Mr. Rifkin, how do you run the world on wind and solar panels and garbage. I mean, that's soft power. Now we can answer the question. It's called Grid IT 2.0. We now have software that allows us to connect hundreds of thousands of desktop computers, millions. When we connect these little desktop computers, the distributed power dwarfs centralized supercomputers. All of industry is using this now. We can take this to power when millions and millions of us, us, become the power sources and share that across continents. The distributed power engulfs anything you could ever imagine with these little teeny centralized nuclear and coal-fired power plants. But this power is local, but it's shared across continents, it's sustainable, and it moves with the rhythms of the system. It creates biosphere consciousness. And that is, when we become responsible for the energy flows in our particular region, which requires us to get back in touch with what the Native American culture did for a long time, which was those cultures here understood that they were completely indebted to the rhythms and flows of the seasonal changes. And therefore, their lives were entrained to those rhythms in a very, very deep way. That's true in most foraging hunting societies, not all. And same in agricultural societies up to a point. So when we become aware that energy is not this stored hunk under the ground, but energy is the sun coming in and out every day and the wind blowing in and out every day and the heat changing under the earth every day and the tides and oceans coming in and out at different frequencies every day. Our biological clocks, our social clocks, our cultural clocks become entrained to the rhythms of the biosphere we're responsible for. When we then connect our little node to all the other nodes across continents, we start to think as a species living in one biosphere. This is not academic. The biosphere is not just a metaphor. It's that sheath from the stratosphere to the ocean depths in which geochemical processes and life interact to create the stability of this earth. This is what Native American culture, Indian culture knew for a long time. The key now is can we create biosphere consciousness overnight? It's already happening. Go into any schoolroom in the world, and this has all happened in five years, and ask an eight-year-old, they're coming home to mommy and daddy, Everyone can tell me this here in the audience. And they're saying to Daddy, why are you using so much water when you shave? Ten-year-olds are saying, why do we have this big car? What, how much, what does this hamburger mean to me on the, on the plate? And where did my clothes come from? They're beginning to realize and be taught that every single activity they engage in has an ecological footprint that affects some other family and some other creature and some other part of the biosphere, correct? We're hearing this from the kids all over the world in less than five, six, seven years. Ecological footprint. This ecological footprint idea is what American Indian cultures were talking about for a long time when they would say, we are all indebted to and obligated to the rhythms and flows of the larger biosphere in which we live. Now we're coming to it in a different way, but it's the same point. So we have a lot to learn and that we can pick up from some of that cultural tradition. But even American Indian cultures, like every other culture, we have to move into the next stage. And the next stage is how do we live in a very complex civilization where we can extend empathy, not just to blood ties and kin ties and religious ties and national loyalty ties, but can we extend empathy to the human race rise in temperature on this earth in this century? That's a middle scenario, now looking optimistic. But to give you a perspective of what three degrees means, if we go up three degrees, that takes us back to the temperature on Earth three million years ago in the Pliocene. Completely different dynamics in the ecosystems. Our scientists say that if we go two to three degrees, and we don't know how we're going to hold it to that now, we will probably face 
the sixth major extinction event in world history. We've had five biological extinction events in 450 million years, at least, in the geological record. Every time we had a mass extinction, it took 10 million years to recover the biodiversity we lost. So our scientists are now saying we are probably in the sixth major extinction event. By the end of the century, parents, we could lose, on the downside, 20 to 25 percent of all the species of life on this earth. On the upper end, 75 percent. That's a wipeout. As my wife says, we are simply not grasping the enormity of this moment. We'd be in emergency mode, not denial. It's all about the hydrological cycle. I wish Al Gore had mentioned this in the film, but he had so much other things to cover. The reason this is so alarming, every one degree Celsius rise in temperature on this planet the atmosphere then absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground. It just sucks it up. So what happens is the whole hydrological cycle that allows us to operate the ecosystems of this planet completely goes a kilter. That means more violent changes in weather patterns, more droughts, more floods, more droughts, longer periods where there's no water at all. That's exactly what's happening all over the world. The droughts, the floods, the hurricanes, the glacier melts, that's what's going on. It's the water cycle that's changing. The ecosystems cannot catch up quick enough and adapt in an evolutionary way to a dramatic change in the hydrological cycle that's virtually measured in decades and maybe in a century or so. I advise the European Union. We went to Copenhagen. And we were, wanted the world to mitigate four, uh, carbon dioxide emission at 450 parts per million by 2050. Our hope was that if we could get the world to do that, we may end up only two degrees. It would be devastating, but we might survive. But then James Hansen, the chief climatologist for the U.S. government, threw us a curve in Brussels. He said, you folks have the numbers wrong. Remember, no one even wanted to play our game in Brussels. It was just the EU, nobody else. But Hansen said, you've got your numbers wrong. His team went down and looked at the geological record. And what they found, of course, is we've never been over 300 parts per million carbon in the last 650,000 years. We're now at 380 with the industrial-induced age. We're going to 450. And at 450, parents, according to our chief climatologist of the U.S. government, I want you to hear this, we go up 6 degrees Celsius in this century. And this is a paraphrase of his report the end of human civilization as we've come to know it and adopt in this world. I hope he's dead wrong. I hope they're all wrong. We wake up from this nightmare. My sense is we are continuing to underestimate the speed of these feedback loops. So, peak globalization, 147 a barrel. Regrowth collapse, regrowth collapse. Climate change now affecting agriculture, infrastructure, and our ability to survive as a species. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with this species? It's not just a matter of finding new ways to organize a global economy and find the right regulatory mechanisms. It's not just about finding the appropriate carbon targets. There's something deeper going on here. What I sense is that the real problem is that we are living off ideas about human nature and the meaning of the human journey and our place on this planet that we inherited 200 years ago at the dawn of the market era. And those ideas are toxic, dysfunctional, and taking us down the road to ruin. At the beginning of the market era, the Enlightenment philosophers took on the church worldview about why we're here, what our role is, and what our motivations are on the planet. You know, for 1,500 years, the church was very clear about this. Every baby is born in sin, depraved, and redemption waits in the next world with Christ. End of story. The Enlightenment philosophers had a different idea about human nature, the meaning of the human journey, and our place in the world. Pre-Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Hobbes, he said, we are an aggressive, violent creature, and its history is a brutish, nasty affair. John Locke came in after that, tempered a little bit, say, well, actually, little babies are born not aggressive and violent, but they're born tabula rasa, blank slate. However, 
and he, this was a little thing he shouldn't have done. They do have a proclivity biologically to want to acquire property. Now, somebody should have caught him on this. <laughs> Blank slate except for that. I'm sure the American Indian cultures could teach him a lesson because for 94% of our existence on this planet, we didn't have a concept of private property. We had the communal we. Adam Smith comes along, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, and says, actually, babies are born to seek autonomy and their self-interest in the market. That's the drive. Then Jeremy Bentham, after the Enlightenment in the 19th century, said, actually, babies are born to seek pleasure over pain. We are ultimately a utilitarian creature. Charles Darwin, the British naturalist, said, actually, every creature is well, born with a drive, to not just to blood survival. ties and kin ties and religious ties and national loyalty ties, but can we extend empathy to the human race as an extended family, our fellow creatures as part of that family, and the biosphere as our community? I don't see why not. Why would we stop at the nation state level? We don't lose all of the past consciousness. It's embedded in a deeper framework. So finally, in closing, I don't know if we'll get there in time. You younger people will find out. Send me a postcard. I don't know. I really don't know. I have to tell you, I think this is a daunting task. This is a good game plan. This is not rocket science, these five pillars. This is moving very quickly now around the world. Germany is leading this right now. I advise the Chancellor, they're leading this revolution. Europe's leading this revolution. But you know, no one can tell a story like America. We just don't have the story. What we want to do is spread this narrative. And once we get the story, we can move very quickly in this country but we're moving into dumbing ourselves down and backing ourselves up in denial. This is not going to work. It isn't drill, baby, drill. It's the all that is the crisis. It's how do we liberate ourselves from an old energy regime and an old technology and an old industrial revolution. So on t in terms of consciousness, this last thought. How many Consciousness can change overnight. How many of you looked into a mirror today? Okay, don't be ashamed. You have to groom yourself. Would you be surprised if I told you that until the 1400s, no one saw themselves? You could look at a piece of metal or a pond of water and not get a very good picture until in Murano off Venice and that little island, they started mass producing reflective mirrors. All of a sudden, a national pastime, I mean a pastime across Europe, people started looking at themselves in the mirror. Oh, that's me. Hmm. That's interesting. That's you. That's interesting. What it did is it developed a deeper sense of selfhood. It changed consciousness. I could now see myself as an individual unique from you, but when I look at you, you're different than me, but then we resemble each other in many ways. You follow me? That changed consciousness. It's called self-reflection. That's what mirrors do, self-reflection. When the Apollo spaceship took its last gate around the dark side of the moon and our boys looked out at the Earth and the sun was shining, boom. They took a few quick photographs and our whole generation put them on the wall. We saw the Earth for the first time from outer space, and it was an out-of-body experience. Every young person in this room does this every day. You go up and Skype with a friend in Tokyo in a classroom project, and then you get that friend's address, and within 10 seconds you go up on your computer and you Google up their address, and Google takes you from outer space right down to their house, and you see the whole neighborhood. That we have a generation that's so connected, you can look from the outside in, from the top down, from the bottom up, from the inside out, and now that communication technology connects us with energy flows so that we can actually see ourselves as nodes, hundreds of millions of nodes, billions of nodes in a biosphere. That's a shift in consciousness. That's dramatic. That needs to be done in less than 30 years. Last thought. How many took your DNA test from National Geographic? Pretty interesting, huh? So National Geographic sends a kit, my wife and my in-laws and I did this, and we take DNA from our cheek, put it in the kit, send it back to the genetics lab, the National Geographic analyzes the DNA, sends us back a map based on our genetics on where we migrated from through our whole ancestral history. They can show the map. That's interesting, but I'm going to save you $100. <laughs> There's something actually more interesting here, and that is that according to the geneticists, I didn't know this, Apparently, 175,000 years ago, Rift Valley of Africa, 10,000 anatomically modern humans, our ancestors, walked in those grasslands. The geneticist located one woman. She's called a data baseline. It's a fictional line. They call her the mitochondrial DNAE. Apparently, 
her genes flowed to everyone in this room. The other ladies didn't make it. Strange still, they locate one man, fictional genetic data line. He's called the Y chromosome male, evidently fairly potent guy. His genes passed to everyone in the other, this room. The other guys didn't make it. Here's the story. We all came from two people. The Bible got this one square on. We could have come from many lineages, but here we are in all of our diversity, and we're fighting, and we have conflict, and we have different stages of consciousness, and we are seeing the potential ruin of our species and a mass die out. We come from family. We have to reintegrate ourselves in the family in a very sophisticated way. We have to move toward biosphere consciousness. We have to lay down a distributed third industrial revolution. We have to have power to the people. We have to begin to see ourselves as stewards not only of our species, but as fellow travelers and good partners with all of our fellow creatures. They have a right to be here with us or without us. It's their planet too. I've learned only one thing in my long life because uh, I don't have any big revelations to share with you, but I know how life is precious. I get up every moment, I say, this is another day. I don't know what this is all about. I'm existentially sometimes lost in this. I mean, when you think about existence, it can be overwhelming to us, but we want it. We have unborn generations, as the Iroquois said, not yet here. Not just our species, but our fellow creatures. Many unborn, not yet here. And as the Iroquois said, we have an obligation to leave this planet in better shape than we got it, to restore this earth so it can flourish, so life itself can continue this little project in the universe. This is the legacy for our generation. And for all you young people here, move this story out. We've got to move from denial to engagement. We've got to move from dumbing down our culture to ratcheting up this conversation. And your generation and your children have to be committed to this with a vigilance that is steadfast and tight. Don't get sidetracked. If we are truly at a pivotal point in our history as a species, then this is the great opportunity in history to come to the floor and do the right thing. Make this revolution happen. Lay down this third industrial revolution infrastructure. Let's rethink our education, our business models, our governance, so we move from centralized to distributed and collaborative power. Let's take our responsibility well, on this. British planet. naturalist said, actually, every creature is born with a drive to reproduce their survival and perpetuate them species. And then to cap it all off, Sigmund Freud at the end of the century said, actually, little babies are born with an insatiable sexual appetite, and all of life is about extinguishing libido. There you have it. So how many people have actually had children here? This is what's coming out of the womb, huh? Aggressive, violent, competitive, self-interested, autonomous-seeking, materialistic, libido-driven little monster. It's, it's, it's pretty sad. And if that is who we are, we're doomed. We're doomed. I don't see any way 6.8 billion human beings are going to come together as a family and steward as partners the rest of our evolutionary kin in one planet if we are the monsters that have been described. But you know what happens in history? As we began to create an idea of who we are, then we create the parenting styles, the educational models, the business models, the governing models to reflect our ideas of who we are, and then we actually become that way. And then we wonder why here in the 21st century we feel so isolated, alone, betrayed, existentially in limbo because our basic drives aren't being met. We have become monsters. At the cutting edge of evolutionary biology and neurocognitive science, our scientists are coming up with breakthroughs in the last 15 years that actually challenge these sibilists of the Enlightenment. They're dramatic. Let me take you back to a sleepy little laboratory in, in um, Italy in 1990s. And scientists had a macaque monkey in the laboratory, and they had an MRI machine on the monkey, and they were watching the monkey open up a nut and they watch which, which neurons lit up in the brain. By sheer accident, and this is how science sometimes evolves, by sheer serendipity, a human being walks into the laboratory right after this experiment, unannounced, and the human being 
sees the nuts and was hungry and opened up a nut to try to eat it himself. The monkey said, who is this invader in my laboratory? He didn't move, the monkey. He just gazed at this human opening the nut, and then the scientists discovered something. They looked at the MRI machine on the monkey. The same exact neurons lit up when the monkey was observing a human open the nut as when the monkey was trying to open up the nut itself, and they had no idea. They thought the MRI machine broke. They didn't know what they found. Then they started putting MRI machine on other primate species, and they found the same thing would happen. Then they put it on humans, and we found all humans have the same response. They discovered mirror neurons in our neural circuitry. We now know humans have them, some primates, elephants. We're not sure about dolphins and other creatures yet. We are wired, apparently, in our neural circuitry for empathic distress. We know this is true. Look, if a spider goes up your arm and I'm watching it, I'll get a creepy feeling. If you puncture yourself and bleed, I'll wince. Crocodiles don't do this, as far as we know. <laughs> this is empathic distress. What I'm suggesting is that what every parent knows, when that little baby is coming out of the womb, their first efforts are to connect. We are the most social creature. We have the biggest neocortex. We are ultimately seek companionship and, and, and affection and intimacy, and we want to belong to larger families of meaning. The worst thing you can ever do to a human being in the world is isolate and ostracize them. We are ultimately social. Adam Smith got this wrong. We don't seek autonomy and self-interest. Although generations of British parents have thrown the kids into the boarding school pretty early with just a little peck on the face, not going to work. So we have discovered homo empathicus. There are so many studies. Uh, in, the, in my book, I talk about thousands of studies that have been done in the last 20 years on how babies think. We never knew how babies thought because they didn't talk. Now we know. I'll just give you one quick study. Yale University. They put all these little 10-month-old babies in the room, crawling on the floor, and they take a plank of wood that goes up like this. Then they take another plank of wood, glue two eyes on it. And the little plank of wood with two eyes tries to get up the plank and falls down every time. All right? Can't make it. Then they have another little piece of wood with two glued eyes, and every time the first piece of wood with two glued eyes tries to go up the plank, the second one helps it up. Then the third piece of wood, the bad wood, two glued eyes, every time the first piece of wood tries to get up the plank, the third piece of wood stops it and pushes it back down. Then they let the babies go. They all crawl up to the helper. They don't crawl up to the hinderer. How do they know to do this? There are countless experiments like this now. Empathy is wired into our circuitry, but it evolves over history. This is important, and this gives me hope. When a little baby in a nursery cries, cries all the other babies the will cry. Wood with two good no eyes tries to go up the plank, the second one helps it up. Then the third piece of wood, the bad wood. Two glued eyes. Every time the first piece of wood tries to get up the plank, the third piece of wood stops it and pushes it back down. Then they let the babies go. They all crawl up to the helper. They don't crawl up to the hinderer. How do they know to do this? There are countless experiments like this now. Empathy is wired into our circuitry, but it evolves over history. This is important, and this gives me hope. When a little baby in a nursery cries, all the other babies will cry. They just have no clue why they're crying. It's empathic distress. Around two years of age, a baby can identify, a toddler can identify themselves in a mirror, and your child knows that's me, that's you. That's the beginning of empathic evolution. It goes with selfhood. Because then I, I know as a two-year-old, if I'm feeling something, I know it's, I'm feeling something that I'm observing you, and then it's coming from me. At eight years of old age, or seven or nine, a kid learns about birth and death that they come from mommy and daddy, they have a one and only life, that every moment is unique, cannot be repeated, and one day they'll cease to be. This existential sense of self-development of an individual allows us to then empathize more broadly with others. In other words, if I know I have a one and only life, that life is fragile, whether you're a fox in the woods or a human being navigating this economic world, then I can see your life as unique. You have your own history. Every moment's unrepeatable, and one day you'll cease to be. It's this growing sense of selfhood that allows us to then experience another as if it were ourselves, and we root for them. If we actually ask what empathy is, we've all experienced it here with our children, our loved ones, etc. It's 
has the width of death to it and a celebration of life. If I'm empathizing with someone else's joy or their sorrow or their anger or disgust, what's happening is I can feel their struggle to be. Whether it's a human or another creature, I can feel that struggle to be as if it was my own. And I realize how fragile and imperfect life is, and then I show my compassion with them as a way to show solidarity and celebrate their life. Hmm? So empathy with people's joy or sorrow is always saying, I'm rooting for you. It's tough to be alive. We're all fragile. We're not going to be here one day, and every moment counts, and I'm here for you. Empathy is the actual invisible social glue of history that allows us to show solidarity in broader fictional families. It's our transcendent value. So I asked the question when I wrote The Empathic Civilization, does empathy evolve over history? Yes. Our historians are of no use to us because they chronicle pathology. If you're a student of history, it's all about wars, conquest, mayhem, exploitation, violence, aggression, and redress of social grievances. If that's truly our history, then we would have perished a long time ago. The reason historians do this is those events are really meaningful because they're out of the ordinary, so we chronicle the wars, the conquests, the exploitation, because they get our attention, fright, flight. We imprint them. But I remember 30 years ago reading George Frederick Hegel had a quote, and I never lost sight of it. He said, happiness are the blank pages of history. They're the periods of harmony. When I wrote this book, I, I went back at him for years and years, and I said, there must be an alternative narrative of history. That's what this is about. It's the blank pages of history that we can see through our narrative, and that narrative shows us something hopeful. With all the downtime, with all the bad periods, we have evolved in consciousness. What is the mechanism? The great changes in consciousness occur when human beings change the way they organize the energy of this earth. We've had many different energy regimes. When we change energy regimes, it allows us to come together in more complex civilizations and integrate in larger wholes. But when we create these possibilities of more complex civilizations, they require a communication revolution to manage them. It's when energy revolutions merge with communication revolutions, it changes gestalt. It changes temporal spatial reference. It changes economics, and it changes consciousness. And empathy evolves. Forager hunters, 94% of our existence. The human body was the energy source. We hadn't domesticated animals, and we didn't know about how to use the currents and the waves and the water. And every forager hunter society in history had language in order to groom and forage and hunt and have sociability. And consciousness evolved mythological consciousness. Every forager hunter society in history had mythological consciousness without exception. And empathy, the basic human drive, evolved to blood ties and related kin ties. And if you were perhaps another group, maybe on the next mountain range, you would not be considered part of the human race. When we went to the great hydraulic civilizations beginning in Sumeria and Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq, the new energy regime stored surplus sun through photosynthesis. We grabbed it with centralized agriculture and we created stored surplus rye, wheat, and barley and the sun's energy was in the grain. But it required a complete change in civilization. We had to indenture thousands of men to build these massive canals. Think of the logistics. We had to set up craft skills to run the dikes. We had to have royal granaries, royal roads, coinage, urban life. It was so complicated, they had to create a communication revolution in Mesopotamia to organize these great canal system agricultures. They created cuneiform. Everywhere we see these great hydraulic civilizations, the Middle East, the Indus Valley of India, the Yangtze in China, Mexico for the Aztecs, every one of them created some form of theological consciousness. The great religions formed back then. I'm Jewish. The Abrahamic religions were the people of the book. It's written down. Buddhism, written down, script. And empathy evolved. And how did it evolve? From blood ties and tribal ties to religious ties. Now, all Jews think of Jews as brothers and sisters, even though they're not kin-related. In first-generation Rome, it was so strange, all these new converts to Christianity started kissing each other in the face and calling themselves brothers and sisters. It was bizarre. They weren't blood-related. 
In the 19th century, we had another convergence of communication energy, a first industrial revolution. Print technology became very cheap. We introduced steam technology into print with linotype and rotary so we could mass produce printed material really cheap, like the internet today. We introduced public schools in Europe and America, and we created a print literate workforce to organize and manage a very complex coal, steam, and rail energy revolution. 